If there is a single thing that united all of ancient Mesoamerica together, it was their use of a common calendar. The Mesoamerican calendar is a calendar unlike any other in the world. It actually wasn't even one calendar, but a combination of several calendars working in conjunction with one another. Different cultures adapted the calendar in unique ways to suit their needs. The calendar was central to Mesoamerican society and helped order everyday life. It was so important to their identity that it even persists to this day. If you happen to find yourself in Mexico or Guatemala, you can still find communities that continue to keep the ancient calendar just as their ancestors did. You may be thinking, big deal, what's so special about a calendar? It's just 365 days. Well, I'm glad you asked, because we're going to dive in and find out how the calendar worked. Before we can discuss how the calendar functioned, we need to know how the people of Mesoamerica counted. After all, you can't have a calendar without counting, and how the ancient Mesoamericans counted had a huge influence on the calendar. So let me give you a very quick tutorial about how the ancient Mesoamericans counted. The people of Mesoamerica used a vigesimal counting system, that is, a base 20 system. What that means is that there's 20 individual base digits. For a comparison, in Western culture, we use a base 10 system with 10 digits, 0 through 9. When we reach 10, the 10's column gains a value and the 1's column restarts. In base 20, there are 20 individual digits instead of 10. So why base 20? Most experts will tell you that it likely comes from 10 fingers plus 10 toes, all the human digits. Perhaps these are what the earliest people in Mesoamerica used to count their numbers. It's very plausible to me, but let's get back to counting. So how does this base 20 system look? Well, let's see how the Mesoamericans would have written these numbers. To write any number, you only need three symbols, a dot, a bar, and a shell. Each dot represents a one, and each bar represents a five. A shell, or sometimes a flower, is used to represent a zero. So counting to 20 would look like this. When you arrive at 20, a 1 goes into the 10s, or in our case, the 20s column, and a 0 goes into the 1s column. When you arrive at 400, the 100s column gains a value, and so on and so forth. So as an example, let's write the number 1307. It would be a 3 in the 400s column, a 5 in the 20s column, and a 7 in the 1s column. Pretty simple, right? Not too difficult to learn. Now that we know how people counted in Mesoamerica, let's look at the calendar in earnest. As I mentioned earlier, the Mesoamerican calendar is actually two calendars cycling together. The first of these was the sacred 260-day calendar. The Maya called this the Tzolkin. The Aztecs called it the Tonalpawali. Why 260 days, you may be asking? Well, no one's positive, but there's a lot of speculation. A popular theory is that 260 days, or about 9 months in our calendar, is the length of one human pregnancy. I've also seen archaeologists suggest that 260 days is an easy number to calculate eclipses with, but regardless of how or why Mesoamerica went with 260 days, the sacred calendar dictated their ritual and religious life. Each day had specific associations and portents. In some Mesoamerican cultures, people were actually named for the day that they were born. In fact, the earliest recorded usage of the sacred calendar doesn't even identify a date, but instead the name of a person at the Zapotec site of San Jose Magote in Oaxaca, Mexico. This individual's name is One Earthquake, presumably the day he was born. Unfortunately for One Earthquake, he's been cut open and he's bleeding to death. Sorry, man. The sacred calendar was made up of 13 months, divided into 20 days each. Now you may think that this would look like 260 days laid out like the calendar hanging on your wall, and you can be forgiven for assuming this, it's how we conceptualize time, but you are about to appreciate the elaborate and intricate way that the Mesoamericans tracked their days. Instead of having the same 20 days each month, Mesoamericans would count 13 days and then reset back to one and continue through the month. So for example, let's look at a typical month in the sacred calendar. The first day is one Emish, the second two Eek, three Akbal, four Khan, 
and so on until we arrive to 13 ben. Instead of proceeding to 14 ish, the count restarts at 1, and we would have 1 ish, even though we're still in the same month. Once we hit 20 days at 7 a how, the next month begins, and the cycle continues at 8 emish. This would continue until the end of 260 days, when we'd be back at 1 emish. Now, the sacred calendar was not used on its own. As you can probably guess, a 260-day calendar would not be very useful for tracking seasons and years. But the ancient Mesoamericans understood this, and they had a better calendar for that. Ticking right alongside the sacred calendar was the 365-day solar calendar, also known by its Maya name, the Hob, and also by its Aztec name, the Shupawali. This solar calendar is often referred to as the vague year, since it did not account for the leap year. Remember, technically a year is not 365 days, but roughly 365 and a quarter days. Now, people were aware of this discrepancy between their calendar and the actual length of the solar year, but they never opted to change their calendar. People are often reluctant to change a calendar, especially one that's very tied up in religion. A good modern example of this is how Orthodox churches continue to use the Julian calendar instead of the more accurate Gregorian calendar. The Hob is made up of 18 months, with 20 days plus 5 extra days at the end of the year, called the Yav. These five days were considered unlucky, and people tried to avoid doing anything important on these days. If you were born during the Yab, it was not an auspicious beginning to your life. Unlike the sacred calendar, the solar calendar works similarly to the Gregorian calendar, which is also a solar calendar. Each month has 20 days like the sacred calendar, but unlike the sacred calendar, each has a consistent way of numbering the days. Let's look at a month in the solar calendar. The first month, Pope. The first of the month would be one pope, the second, two pope, the third, three pope, and so on. Once we arrive at the end of the month, we don't use 20 pope, as you would expect. Instead, you would seat the next month of the calendar, woe. Thus, the 20th day of pope would be called the seating of woe. So what happens when we bring the sacred calendar and the solar calendar together? Let's find out because this is what makes the Mesoamerican calendar so special. These two calendars create a cycle that resets every 52 years. That cycle is called the calendar round. Mesoamericans were perfectly aware of this cycle and used it to count their years. The way that they counted their years was called the year bearer system. This worked by taking the day that the year would start on and making that the year, with a number to indicate which year in the cycle it was. By a mathematical quirk, the solar calendar could only start on one of four days from the solar calendar. Ik, Manik, Eb, or Kaban. Thus, the first year in the cycle would be one Ik, followed by two Manik, three Eb, four Kaban, five Ik, and so on. At the end of the 52-year cycle, everything would begin again with the same sacred calendar date, solar calendar date, and year. Thus, nearly every date in a person's life was utterly unique, and you could easily date an event in your own lifetime precisely. The calendar round was ubiquitous across all of Mesoamerica, with only a few exceptions. So how would we read an entire date in this system? Let's take everything we've learned and describe a date. Now, everything you've seen thus far has been in Maya, and this time, let's see a date as the Aztecs would have done, just to change things up. The first year in Nahuatl would be one Kipactli, one Atalcoalo, in the year one Kali. Or, to make it easier, one crocodile, one rising tree, in the year one house. You can actually get further into this because other calendars tracked other numerations of time, but for now, let's keep this simple. Remember, this date would not repeat again until another 18,890 days after the 52-year cycle began again. To the Aztecs, the end of the 52-year cycle was a dreaded occasion where the fifth sun could be destroyed if the gods were not placated and honored properly. To make sure that this happened, the Aztecs would perform the new fire ceremony and ensure that creation would continue just the same. Now, you may have noticed something unusual about the calendar round. It only tracks years in 52-year cycles before it resets. 
So if someone told you that your city was founded on 8 Ahau, 13 Yash, that doesn't tell you how long ago it was founded. It would be like someone telling you that the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan was conquered in 21. That could mean 1421, 1521, or 1621. While the calendar round and year bearer system were excellent at tracking local events, it wasn't very well equipped to record events that happened in the distant past. For people who had little interest in recording such events, this wasn't a problem. If you're a simple everyman and all you need is a calendar for farming, festivals, and holidays, the sacred calendar and solar calendar work just fine. But what if you're a king or a high priest, and you need to record your accomplishments and to celebrate those of your ancestors? For many cultures in Mexico, the Aztecs included, this was never enough of a concern to abandon or change the calendar round and the year bearer system. But for other people in Mesoamerica, this wasn't doing the job. As they started to record ever more distant historical events, they needed a way to fix historical dates with no ambiguity. To solve this, they created the long count. The long count was a linear count of days that allowed people to precisely anchor the calendar date to a specific historical date. If you've ever seen a Maya inscription, you've almost certainly seen a date recorded in the long count whether you knew it or not. Although they're not the only users of the long count, the Maya were definitely the most prolific users of it. So how does the long count work? The long count counts the days from a single start date. That's right, days, not years. Keep that in mind. The days are not counted individually, but in groups of 20. Remember, in Mesoamerica, you have to count in 20s, not 10s. Just like how we have years, decades, centuries, millennia, the Maya had their own periods based on their vigesimal system. Let's go through them. In the Maya long count, a single day is called a keen. 20 keens make a weenal. 18 weenals make a toon. It should be noted that many people think of a toon as a year, but it's only 360 days, so it isn't a true solar year. Remember, we're counting days, not years. 20 tunes make up a katun, and 20 katuns make up a baktun. There are actually higher counts beyond a baktun, but those were seldom used and we won't discuss them here. When you write a date in the long count, you write it like this. Thus, the date of January 1st, 2020 would be written as 13 baktun, 0 katuns, 7 tunes, 2 winals, 5 keen. The anchor date of the calendar was August 14th, 3114 BCE. How the creators of the long count settled on that specific date is a mystery and will likely remain one forever. The Maya believed that date to be the start of the fourth creation. Interestingly, they didn't write that initial date as zero, but instead as 13 Bakhtuns. They would have said that 13 Bakhtuns were completed during the previous creation. By the way, this is the origin of the whole Maya 2012 prophecy. December 21st, 2012 marked the completion of the 13th Bakhtun. Back when we were all young, there was almost a whole cottage industry in Maya studies focused around this question that I remember fueling a lot of programming on the History Channel. But thankfully, the industry has busted and we are all very much alive. In reality, there's evidence that the Maya didn't believe that the world would end in 2012, but that it would rather be an important anniversary of creation. So there's that. The origins of the long count are obscure. The earliest long count date known is from Stila II at Chiapa de Corzo, with a long count date of 7 Bakhtun, 16 Katun, 3 Tun, 2 Winal, 13 Keen, or December 9, 36 BCE. The next oldest long count date is a few years later at Tres Sapotes, with a date of 7 Bakhtun, 16 Katun, 6 Tun, 16 Winal, 18 Keen, or September 3rd, 32 BCE. Both of these sites are actually Olmec-influenced sites, and as a result, most scholars agree that the long count took its final form in the 1st century BC in what was then Olmec land. Now, with all that in mind, let's have a little fun with everything we've learned and examine an actual Maya long count inscription. Let's take a look at this inscription from the Maya city of Piedras Negras, or as the Maya called it, Yoquib. 
Now, this will get a little complicated, but it does a good job of showing how much information the Maya tracked with their date inscriptions. First, we have the introductory glyph at the top. This just informs us that we have a date. Going down from left to right in a zigzag pattern, we have 9 bok tunes, 15 kat tunes, 10 tunes, then 0 winals and 0 keens. The next glyph is the calendar round date, 3 a how. The date written here is June 26, 741 CE. That's pretty straightforward, but there's still more glyphs with supplementary information. These glyphs get called, unsurprisingly, the Supplemental Series. The next row begins with the Ninth Lord of the Night, followed by the Lunar Series. The next glyph shows that 29 days have elapsed since the new moon. The next two rows say that this is a third lunation in a cycle of six consecutive lunations, and that that lunation has 30 days. Phew! As you can see, the Maya were very particular about how they recorded important events. And if you think that I deliberately chose a complex inscription, I assure you that this is a very normal, even easy example. There are others that are far more complicated. As you saw in the previous inscription, the Maya recorded lunar cycles. They did such a good job of this that they could even predict lunar eclipses. An eclipse was a very big deal and could have very profound consequences on the omens of that day. So accurate was their lunar tracking that the Maya eventually figured out that 165 lunations, or lunar cycles, equals 4400 days. To put that in perspective, that calculates to one lunation every 29.53020 days. Now, modern calculations put that at 29.53059. That is impressive. And that's not even the only astronomical cycle that they tracked. There were additional cycles for other planets and celestial bodies, but those are topics for later. Speaking of cycles, I hope you've noticed something very important about the Mesoamerican calendar that underscores the Mesoamerican understanding of time. Unlike our notions of time, which are usually linear, Mesoamerican cultures saw time as a cycle. The calendar reflects this unique perception. As I mentioned earlier, the calendar was not just a count of days, months, years, but a repeating cycle of the sacred and solar calendars, one divine, the other earthly. Every date on the calendar, with its own omens and portents, would return again and again through time. When a king celebrated an achievement, he could show where those achievements fit into the cycle of time and how they echoed those of history. After all this, I would guess that you are either in awe of the Mesoamerican calendar or thankful for the simplicity and familiarity of your own calendar. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed this quick look at what I think is one of the most amazing calendars ever made. Take care, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more ancient American content.